Welcome to another installment of Learning to Program for your iPhone or iPad. Today we're going to be looking at programming considerations. This is Dr. Brian Burton. I'm a professor and also the CEO and main contributor to Burton's Media Group.com. Now, I want to look at and discuss some considerations when you're getting started with programming for the iPhone, iPod Touch, or the iPad. The information for developing for any of these devices is all based upon Objective-C. Now there's a ton of information available on Objective-C programming through the developer website on developer.apple.com. Lots of good information is available there for learning Objective-C, plus there's many good books on programming in Objective-C. For all of my tutorials, I'm going to make the assumption that you've got some background in computer programming, that this is not your first programming language. Um, I will discuss some of the changes and differences in, for programming in Objective-C. I came into Objective-C from a Java background. Now, some other considerations when you're programming for these develop these applications is that only one application can be running at a time on the iPhone, iPod Touch, and iPad. Now this is until the implementation of OS 4 which will allow for multitasking within the environment. You also need to consider that you're only working with one window at a time. The size is fixed to the size of the iPhone screen, iPod screen, or the iPad. Uh, you, you're not working with a windowed type environment as you would normally find on a PC or a Mac system. And you do have limited access. Your application is running inside of its own sandbox to protect the rest of the applications and the operating system from your application and to protect your application from everybody else's. Now some other Objective-C considerations as you're getting started. First of all, you'll commonly see ID used in your programming. ID is commonly used to store any kind of generic object. It, think of it as a good storage device for most types of objects that you're going to be using when you're programming inside of Objective-C. If you place a plus sign before a method, it identifies it as a static method. If it has a minus sign before the method, it is considered an instance of that method. Uh, as well as uh, another consideration is the properties. Properties do allow your programmers to directly access the variables rather than needing to use a get or a set. Now if you've ever done any uh, Java or C programming, you know that quite often you need to create a get or set for your object-oriented programming. Um, with Objective-C, properties automatically take care of that for you and set everything up as a public variable for your, cons for your use inside of your object. Uh, a few more considerations when you're doing your development. You're, you have a limited response time. Apps need to be snappy as in they need to have some kind of response in less than five seconds. Now if your application takes a long time to load all of the data and get ready to go, you need to have a splash screen or some type of information pop up there and show that something is happening. Show that there is activity occurring inside the system or people are going, are going to assume that your application is frozen and isn't doing anything and is, are going to close it. And that won't make you happy and that won't make the people who paid for your application happy. Also your screen size is very limited in pixels. For the original iPhone, iPhone 3G, 3GS, iPod touches, you're limited to 480 by 320 pixels. Now that's not a lot of screen real estate so you need to use those pixels very wisely. With the new iPhone 4G you've got 960 by 640 so you've got a little bit more room to work with. Um, it, it's going to be real nice to have those extra pixels. For the iPad, you've got 1024 by 768, so a lot more screen real estate to work with, and real nice resolution. Um, you also have very limited system resources. When you're programming for the iPhone or the iPod Touch, you need to keep in mind that you're working with about 120 megabytes of RAM. 
While you do have a fair amount of storage, uh, usually considered to be around 4 gigabytes or more, it, you really don't have that much. That 128 megabytes of RAM is being shared by other system resources. And if you're using up 4 gigabytes of storage on the device, you better have a good reason for using that much space. Uh, with most of the iPhones being around 16 gigabytes to 32 gigabytes, if you're using up a fourth of their storage capacity for your application, you better have a real good reason why. Another consideration is that inside Coco, there are, is no garbage collection, so you have to manually release the objects when you're done with them, and you'll see that as we get further into the coding, that we, we will be releasing all of our objects. Um, some other considerations when you're getting started. What kind of an account or license should you get with Apple? Most of my students start with a university developer's license. Our university that I worked with for some time has a university developer's account and everybody who takes my iPhone programming class gets an account through that. Um, these are free but they do not allow you to publish any of the apps that you've made. You can deploy the apps to your own personal devices, but you cannot sell it on the iTunes Store. One step up from that would be your standard developer's account. Now this is for the average person who wants to sell something on the iTunes Store. The, the licensing is $99 a year and it does give you full access to the, um, the SDK as well as any beta SDKs that are forthcoming. The Enterprise Developers account is a different kind of situation. It allows the user to develop for very large organizations, organizations that have over 500 employees. That's 500 employees are considered the minimum for an Enterprise Developers account, and it is primarily for, for applications that are only going to be used internally within the organization. They're going to be only deployed internally, not sold on the iTunes Store. So for the most people, you're going to want to get a standard developer's license. That's going to take care of the majority of people that are doing development out there. You can find more information on the different types of developers' accounts and licensing at uh, developer.apple.com. Um, I have placed on my blog, as well as here on YouTube, a Hello World project. Um, it's specifically de designed around the iPad, but everything that I show in there also applies for the iPhone. All of the same methodology is used, so you're welcome and encouraged to please view those projects. Now, when you're developing for the iPhone, iPod Touch, or iPad, you need to follow the basic model view controller framework. When you're developing the app, the first thing you need to do is look at your model. Your model is what's going to hold your application's data. These are your objects that are going to be used within the environment for holding and displaying that type of information. View is the window, the controls, the user interface, the views that people are going to see. And then the controller is what connects or binds the model and the view to con together. Um, you'll see this in the demonstrations that we're going to be doing together that you've a digital connection, a virtual connection if you will, between the buttons, the objects that are in the system and the code that relates to it. So it's very critical that you understand that you are creating a model view controller type process and you need to follow this repetitively throughout the building of your applications. Well, I hope this has been informative and helpful. Please don't hesitate to stop by and view our website at burtonsmediagroup.com and we have a lot of tutorials on using iPhone, iPod Touch, iPad, and as well as some Flash and Java tutorials.